Welcome to another episode of the F Word and Friends. And we've got a special guest here today. No worry, Francho Leclerc has not been replaced yet. You know? <laughs> can so, we talk about it? We can talk yeah, about it afterwards. Yeah, that we'll was see quick. how uh, Lihani fares. Now, Lihani, welcome. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about a, a specific topic that we see a lot with, with our clients. We always talk about the market and how the market performs, but we know that the behavior of the investors actually has a bigger impact than most of them realize. So today we want to talk about behavioral finance and just what people maybe can identify in themselves and things they are not aware of. So Leon is from Alan Gray, business development manager for the last seven and a half years. So we're welcome. Thank you. So some of, I mean, some of your clients might be familiar with the topic of behavioral finance, and that is sort of where we take the insights from psychological research and we apply it to financial decision making and sort of to to, to go deep into the topic I want to kick us off by the framework of two minds so the framework of two minds is a concept that refers to two cognitive processes when it comes to making decisions about finances and one is your emotional mind and your rational mind so your rational mind is analytical quick uh, or not necessarily quick, but it's it's sort of it's analytical and it, it reasons and so forth. Where the emotional mind is something that is more intuitive, it is impulsive, and it is actually influenced by um, by emotions and biases. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with uh, the author. Well, he eventually was ended up being an author, but he was a Nobel Prize winner for economics. Daniel Kahneman. So he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. So Daniel Kahneman also looked at the brain as having a double processor, or two systems, if you will. So system one being um, your uh, sort of um, emotional system, your intuitive system, and system two being your reasoning system. So again, if we look at the two systems, system one is it uh, initiates tasks like fight or flight, tying your shoelaces, um, uh, detecting threats and opportunities, um, and it also can do multiple tasks simultaneously. Um, the sort of the thing that we should also realize is it can also lead us to make generally correct conclusions, system one. And system two is your reasoning system. So it considers careful analysis or it considers the situation at hand and um, it does the slower thinking of that. And with both systems, I mean, both of them can have bugs and features. And sometimes when these bugs and features interact with each other, that is where it leads us to making these, these bad decisions. Yeah, so it's interesting. So and you would know with clients, so every client has have basically system one and two because we normally we know certain clients are more emotional and we... Yeah. We, we say that's their personality, but not necessarily, or they're more, more prone maybe to use system two than system one. Is yes. that correct? So every client basically has an emotional side and a more Absolutely. rational side. But I think that is why it is so incredibly important that system two is nurtured so that that rational, logical judgment can prevail. And when we're making big decisions and taking risks, specifically when it comes to investments, it is better to think slow. Mm. But most people think actually or make a decision of system one and then they affirm that of system two. So mm. Like mm. political party, I believe he is correct, so then I will say, mm. Mm. look for mm. the rational. Yeah. And I think investing is exactly the same. Exactly. Mm. Mm. And I think you can't do one without the, without the other because I mm. think there should always still be an element of uh, emotions involved. I think it just shouldn't uh, completely consume the decision that has to be made. And I mean, we can also have a look at um, different uh, investor or behavior traps, rather. So one of them that we often see is herd mentality or the power of conformity. Um, and I, I think we're all guilty of herd mentality. So um, we'd rather be wrong in the company of many than be wrong all by ourselves. Yeah. And we like mimicking the behavior of others. But yeah, I think it's FOMO is also the word now because we yeah. talk about the bri, we talk about people sitting around the bri. Now, if everybody's investing in, let's say, Bitcoin, let's use Bitcoin, I'm so scared I lose out. And maybe Bitcoin is going to grow like my friends are saying. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. And if we are wrong, at least we're wrong together. Yes. That's 100% yeah. correct. Exactly yeah. that. But I think when it comes to investing, sometimes it is better to steer clear from this herd 
to avoid or the, to avoid the heartache of investment trend possibly gone wrong. Um, and one of the, uh, the other traps that we also see is the behavior gap. And I think that sort of the behavior gap has sort of been made popular by, by Carl Richards. And if we have a look at the average performance of the S&P 500 in the last 30 years, 10.7% versus the average equity fund um, investor, it is more on the line of 6%. And what is that gap? Immediately odd 4% of the gap that is created. And I actually refer, heard someone refer to it as the behavior tax, which I actually think is a, is a, is a nicer, yeah. it lands better. And the behavior gap exists because there's emotional switching in and out of funds and these cognitive biases that we'll discuss um, after that. And remember also the behavior gap, if it goes into that roller coaster of emotions when it comes to our investing. Markets are up, there's a feeling of euphoria, we would not consider to get out or leave our investments at that point because we're confident in our choice and we believe good times will continue. But that point is also the point of maximum financial risk. And it's only after we experience the, the, the pain of loss where we feel compelled to get out at the worst possible time mm -hmm. versus staying buckled up on that roller coaster waiting for that volatility to end. Yeah, if we just look at the markets now, if you tell your client we must get out of the Magnificent Seven and get into SA equities because valuation is exactly that Magnificent Seven very high, SA equity very low. You know, no one wants to do that or wants to hear that because they, they want to go where the winners are. But that's maybe perhaps exactly the wrong time to do it and uh, get in while it's cheap, but also that people, you know, it's difficult to convince our clients and that's what we see. They do want to ride the roller coaster that's already at that peak, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, again, let's sort, of, let's sort of dive into like one of the most observed or widely observed biases, and that's recency bias. And that is where the, the investor uh, has the tendency to overvalue the most recent information. And that can become your enemy. And why is that? Because it can sort of overcloud your judgment. And the more recent the fear as well, like COVID is a good example, the, the, the more likely there will be a, a, a skewness of the appraisal of risk and reward. Um, and uh, sort of there's, there's, with every bias, there's always going to be a counter. There's always going to be a little tip to say, but how do you avoid this? And recency bias is always, and it's, and it's quite simple. You must have a long-term perspective and you need that. Uh, you need to seek professional advice. Um, so that is sort of the way to counter that. And um, we've also seen it in, in our world where clients would refer to our previous one year performance and base their decision on that. Where we would see the previous one year alpha or performance was high, which led to quite an influx of funds into or money into a fund because that based their decision on the previous one year, that recent performance. And that is, that is a massive um, behavior pitfall. Yeah, and you see it in the investment flows. Everyone's going to money market or income funds when yeah. interest rates are high. Mm -hmm. And when that one year results is very good. Or the multi-asset SA equity mm -hmm. is under no one wants it now. Again, we're not saying go into that. Mm -hmm. That's not the advice. But yeah. Just be, like you said, have a longer term. But also the recency bias, I think, has been made worse with social media. Because now if you Google something and you, is NFT is a good investment. Then the work first article will go. And the more you click on that, the more you will get information that favors that standpoint. And I remember a guy saying he, he had an hour and a half in the car and all he heard was this great news about NFTs. You, now you're in a different world when you get out of the car. The rest of the world have not heard what you have, but the more you go into that rabbit hole, the more it will give you information that confirms what you are looking for. And that's... That, that awareness. But that's also a bias. So that is confirmation bias. So in our information overloaded world, I mean, we can easily find the information online, or not just in the media, but through opinions as well, to confirm our own theories. And I mean, we will always find something to justify our actions. And the information is there. So something that can be done to, to counter that is you need to separate the wheat from the chaff. 
So we need to focus on what is important. And a client that is a long-term investor must realize that short-term noise is exactly just that. It's noise. And you should not consider basing your um, decision on everyday news, switching in and out of funds or buying funds based on everyday news. It could potentially mean locking in a loss that could have otherwise been avoided. Mm. Investors should not consider making any changes to their investments if their goals have not changed or there is a really a personal circumstance that is, that is needing that. Um, we need to challenge our worldviews. Because remember, you, you, sort of, you can easily get stuck in your own, on, own opinion. And with the media and opinions out there to confirm it, rather challenge that worldview. Get an opinion that differs from your own. So that you can sort of get a more holistic um, perspective of the information you have. And also go back to the source. I think it is extremely important to rather look at the source material, again, to expand the information that you have to, so that you can also better understand it versus acting emotionally on the first story you hear or read. Yeah, and the motive why they are saying that. So I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So there's always a motive why they say that something that mm -hmm. confirmed that. Yeah. So I think if, 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 if you go back to those two, those two points, the emotional side and the factual side, now, obviously, I think many things in life, um, you definitely need balance. And, and these two play together, and they have to play together for us to be successful. But for us as advisors as well, I think we are speaking about clients, but these are the sort of things that we sit with as well. You know, we've got these, yeah, we've got these biases ourselves. But understanding these biases, and I think that's the point of the discussion, understanding these biases, not just for the client, but for ourselves as well, we can sort of, you know, tweak or, you know, the, the way that we think in order to make it better for our clients, but for ourselves as well at the end of the day. I just want to touch on that point, maybe with Giuliani. Where does gut feeling come, mm. come in? You know, because when they sit in front of an advisor, they say, how do I choose an advisor? I'm going to follow my gut feel. Okay, now is that an emotional one? And is it, a, is it good to use that? Because a lot of people say follow your gut. Or should you go and look at, you know, this how qualified they are, what, you know, all the statistics and the more detailed stuff mm -hmm. they give. You know, it's difficult to balance those two. And I think you can use both, but to be aware that there's an emotional yeah. side and a more rational the side. Awareness. The awareness. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to, Your gut, I would say, falls into system one, mm. the emotional system or the intuitive system. I definitely fall into that. And remember, both has bugs, bugs and features. Um, the last... Uh, uh, bias we see and I sort of I, I just targeted like three of the big ones the mostly observed ones is loss aversion mm -hmm. so there's the saying that the pain from loss is twice as hard as the joy from gains and um, there's I mean for most investors and myself included the first time they experienced a massive drawdown in the markets was in, in, right. during the pande mm -hmm. pandemic mm -hmm. and it was also the pain you see when seeing your investment um, goes down with 30%, that pain is not something that goes away quickly mm. and it actually lingers. Now scientists, have, they've actually discovered that or proved that the pain that you feel from a financial loss, your brain reacts similar to that than what your brain reacts to physical pain. Mm. And you protect yourself from future pain by saying, let me rather do something prudent um, by switching out of the market and going into a money market, for instance. And while we can't remove that feeling from pain, it does, it does obviously help knowing or understanding which losses are permanent and which are temporary. Um, and I think that is, that is refreshing. And mm -hmm. with all this being said, I like to always go back to Carl Richards. He, he's like the finan behavioral finance guru. And he reminds us the things that we should focus on. That is the things that matter and the things that we can control. And sort of in, in our, your world and my own world, it feels like we've all been conditioned to think that uh, invest, or investment returns is the only variable that matters. But it is refreshing to realize that there's so many other levers. And even more importantly, we have more control over these levers. We have more control over our objectives and goals. We have more control over how much we save, 
for how long our risk appetite are we investing for capital growth or for income versus what we have over market returns. And the more we realize what happens in the economy is 100% out of our, our control and f go back the step to say that it's empowering to think that there's still so many decisions investors are going to make with the help of their financial advisors to positively influence their well, their investment outcomes and subsequently their, their financial futures yeah. as well. Yeah, another big one that you can control is tax planning. That's why you can add tax alpha as well. Because yeah. that's one thing you can control is about structuring mm. and investment returns <clears throat> on that as well. Yeah. yeah, and I like what you said, what's permanent and what's only temporary. Mm. And I remember a client of mine, so 2022, it was a terrible market. Oh, in, oh, yeah. yeah, in the US market. And she said she lost 30% of her uh, portfolio. I said, you don't lose it. But if we swap out now, then it's permanent. Yeah. And we knew it was only temporary and look yeah. at 2023, then it bounced back today. She's the happiest client because she did not act on that. But that was completely under control, her behavior, not what the markets did. So definitely a good point. So, I mean, sort of to, to elaborate on exactly what you said. So we've actually, we see there's massive potential or we see the need in the value of the advisor or the, the value of advice. And there's a lot of studies and surveys out there that is meant to to quantify what is the value of the financial advisor. And given the holistic financial approach that most advisors have, it is quite broad and has many categories. So one such a study was done by Russell Investments and they uh, identified four areas of value contribution. And one of them was uh, actively uh, rebalancing the investment portfolios that actually had a contribution of 0.1%. Um, specific or bespoke uh, client experience and planning, um, that was more in the line of 1.2%. Tax smart planning, 1.2% odd. But the biggest contributor, and I'm not surprised here, was the, the value that an advisor contributes to the client uh, in, in terms of their role as uh, behavioral coach and that contribution was actually determined to be two point odd three percent so and again it's no surprise and if you sort of combine those four um, components that they identify contributes the most value it equates to 4.9 percent and remember that 4.9 percent that the so advisor well. adds it's on that investment return yeah. and again it's it's talking people off the ledge because yeah. you have that voice of reason in your advisor to, to, to be that coach. Sometimes it's just an extra barrier you have to get through because you can't mm -hmm. move your money just in and out of the market. Yeah. Now they have to contact someone and they know actually it's the wrong thing to do, <laughs> but they don't want to tell you they want to move. So then they just keep yeah. it like that. And because of that, they don't do anything. Because I know if it's in a bank account, they're going yeah. to switch. And, and they're happy stuff. about it later. <laughs> yeah, Much yeah, later. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, and it's very interesting stats that, and I think, 100% because we are not emotionally involved like they are with their money. I mean, we are emotional with our money, even us uh, with our own money. But once it's someone else's money and they are in that bias that they don't know about, we can see from the outside and say, rather do this or this is what we recommend. I think that's why it's so important to have an advisor just to look out from the outside. Yeah. It's not emotionally involved. The, the objective perspective. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Catch yeah. So <laughs> I think to sort of summarize like everything we discussed today is toolkit to help clients stay on the course and that takes us back to nurturing that system too and how do you nurture that system too? Think slow. Mm. Um, we need to lean in on adopting good behavioral um, uh, habits. That is, that is important. We need to remember with uncertain times, I mean we've been here before, um, Remember, what, what, what's the things that we should focus on? The things that matter and the things that we can control. And lastly, your voice of reason or your accountability partner, your financial advisor. So that is sort of the toolkit that everyone can leave with you know, a couple of nuggets of wisdom so to, to help them navigate through the noise that the investment landscape sort of creates. Yeah, I remember I asked your colleague in Cape Town that I work with, and he said, what makes a good advisor versus a, not a good advisor? And he says, the one, the more the behavioral coaching, yes. more acting as a coach yes. with your client, walk this way, this mm -hmm. road with him, mm -hmm. but 
coach is behavior or be always be there when he makes a decision. And this is this is why I find this information so enlightening because it it, it just brings a second layer of value contribution to the entire client's experience. So gentlemen, we must work on our skills to <laughs> identify the problems of our clients. But thank you very much, Liani. Um, Francia, it's going to be tough for Francia to get back into the seat. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a, another conversation, but thank you. Very interesting. And if you have any questions or comments about this topic, it would be nice to hear that as well. Thank you.